we're going to look at current events. That looks a bit better, doesn't it? We've got Putin there giving the wink of deception. Uh, President Donald Trump and a few missiles and the US dollar. <clears throat> now, before I start tonight, um, I would like to have a little flashback to 2016. And it was the Jewish Jubilee year that ended in October 2016. Now, why I wanted to go back to this was a little pet topic of mine, as some of you might know. Now, you may be thinking, hang on, wasn't it a Jubilee year in 1967? So 50 years on that brings us to 2017. But keep in mind that Jewish years are a little bit different and uh, they're on lunar months and years and things like that. So it's a little bit staggered and it's a little bit different. But the Jubilee is an exciting and a happy time. The Jubilee. So what happens at a Jubilee? All debts are wiped clean. Land taken from you is given back. Slaves go free and you go home to be with your family. <clears throat> it levels out the playing field a bit, doesn't it? The way that God's created this 50-year cycle, it gives back the rich, give back to the poor that was taken from them originally. But that doesn't happen today, does it? What did we read in the news the last couple of weeks? Eight men, the eight richest men, own more than 50% of what uh, the 50% of the population, the population earns. Only a few years ago, it was 67 people. There's the men there. And I'm sure there's probably a few men that own the big banks of the world that probably aren't even listed there. <clears throat> people who owe debt have masters and are slaves. So what happened in 2016 that has this jubilee theme? To be made free and to break our chains... Has anyone got any ideas, 2016? I mean, there's two events that I'm thinking of in particular. Brexit? Yeah, so Brexit was a cutting off from those that oppressed them, and as I like to call them, the fat cats. There's a fat cat there, and uh, that's a pretty big one. <laughs> that's a big cat. And there's another one. <clears throat> there was hundreds of politicians in the EU in fact, a reporter would come down the street and he said to people on the street, do you know who the leaders, the mayors and the politicians are? Do you even remember voting these people in? Do you realise that they're on 250, 300 grand a year for writing laws, passing them to benefit themselves and the big companies? The EU parliament is actually very shady and the, the leaders would write so many rules and regulations that would be okay for the big companies, but the small businessmen that wanted to start a business struggled with all the rules and all this paperwork. So there we have a toothbrush. So if you wanted to start a small business uh, selling toothbrushes because it was your dream, 31 rules regarding toothbrushes. I mean, I mean, you, so you could probably think, okay, I can sort of see how there's 31 rules there regarding the toothbrush. Then we have the towel. How many rules were there regarding the towel? 454 laws regarding the towel. So if you started a business and you were making towels, there's 450 laws to think about. Otherwise, you could get sued and go bankrupt. Milk. How many laws were there regarding milk? 1,260 laws regarding milk. So the EU politicians were quite scared of milk. I guess it goes off, and I don't know what else they could go wrong with it. But. So you see all these rules and regulations that help those that were rich and the big companies, um, and that's, that's who they helped. So the poor and the middle class were like, that's it, we've had enough of being repressed. We want out, and of course you remember the media, the mainstream media was biased, of course. They tried to keep everyone back in. So if you leave, there's going to be a massive financial crisis because they, well, the media obviously is owned by the rich and their interests were staying in the EU. And some people call it the Brussels gravy train. And if you remember, all these fear tactics were used by all the leaders, even President Obama flew over and he gives his speech on why they must stay in. Brothers and sisters, the Brexit was a mini revolution. It was a jubilee. It was the poor man, the middle man, saying we want our land back, 
just we want our fishing grounds back. We want our, all our hard work and our profits to profit our family and to look after our family. And we don't want to put all that hard work and money into the politicians' pockets. And that same thing went on to the US elections. Guess who? There's a couple of bananas and uh, I think you guys call that Fritz. That's called Devon Trump or Fritz Trump. We saw the rise of a businessman, not a politician, Donald Trump. And I believe that the people chose Donald Trump the same reason people chose to leave the Brie exit. What was the alternative? Hillary Clinton. More of the same. The smooth talk. Someone that the big banks had endorsed with millions and millions of dollars should ring alarm bells in your head. And this is an email leak that came out. And this is what Hillary Clinton said. Politics is like a sausage being made, Mrs Clinton told the National Multi-House Council. It is unsavoury and it always has been that way. But we usually end up where we need to be. But if everyone's watching, you know, all the backroom discussions and the deals, you know, then people get a little nervous, to say the least. So you need a public and a private position. Well, with Donald Trump, we get, we get to see the sausage being made right in front of our eyes. Oh, and there we go. Join Dell. No, thank you. Oh, and here's just another thing as well. Hillary Clinton's daughter, Chelsea, allegedly used resources from the Hillary Clinton Foundation that's supposed to help poor people around the world to go forward to a wedding. New WikiLeaks email uh, support. Um, <clears throat> so there you can see the, the choices that we had. And this is a journalist on Trump. People are upset. They're angry at the system. And they see Trump, not so much that they agree with him, but they see him as a human Molotov cocktail or grenade that they get to toss into the system with Brexit and to blow it up and to send a message. We have had enough of being sucked dry by the rich and by the establishment. If you watched the mainstream media, you would have thought Hillary was going to win. Every poll said that she was in the lead and everyone loved her and even the exit polls and all the Hollywood was behind her and all the sing stars. And you would have thought, this is it, she's ahead. And it continues on now, doesn't it? The mainstream media is Donald Trump's opposition party. So expect in the future the mainstream to criticise absolutely everything that he does. Now, I don't like any politician and I'm not endorsing Donald Trump. Jesus is my leader and he is my king. So I just wanted to make that clear. So you can see these things that started in 2016. They've got the ball rolling, haven't they? We have a look in Europe. At the end, in November and December, Italy had an election to vote out their former Prime Minister, or um, whoever it was, the President, to vote in someone who would actually is thinking of leaving the EU. We also have France is having an election, and the person who is in favour is winning popu uh, popularity is thinking of leaving the Euro and the EU. And we, ha we have these kind of movements, don't we, against those who are rich from the poor and the middle class. It's because it's getting bigger and bigger. We had this week Romania protests grow over corruption decree. The Romanian capital has seen one of its largest ever anti-government protests after a decree was passed that could free dozens of officials jailed for corruption. So we have these guys who are at the top and they're being jailed for corruption and all of a sudden this law has been passed that they can go free and the people are like, no, that's not justice and there was these huge riots in the country. So these two events that we had in Jubilee, the US elections, Donald Trump, and also the Brie exit, they've shaken the world, haven't they? We're, in, we're heading down a path that's totally different from what we were on. Those in power did not want the Brie exit to happen, well, the globalist power, and they did not want Trump to win either. So what is the plan of God? Is it the plan of God to destabilise the EU? Well. Uh, from my limited knowledge, we know that the Ten Kings will reign and give power to the beast. But this thing I also know, that in fear, people will give all their freedom for a little bit of security. And as one politician put it, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that is, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. That's to take away people's freedom and to implement laws that benefit the government and the rich, to have more power and authority over them. So 
If the, law, if, the world, if the whole world had followed the Jubilee, God's plan, these imbalances between rich and the poor would not happen, would they? How much of a better place would it be if we actually followed those laws? And tonight, I actually wanted to look at fake news and I wanted to look at ISIS. Um, we had some weird events before the election, didn't we? Um, there was misinformation everywhere. We had the CIA bringing up things about Hillary Clinton and then taking them back and all this just days before the election. And even in the news outlets that we trust, they were biased. And even the BBC, I believe, had an agenda up, in, uh, up through the election. What are we going to be, brothers and sisters? Jesus says to us, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. We need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Beloved, do not believe everything or every spirit that you hear, but you have to test the spirits to see where they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And that's what we have, don't we? We have so many false prophets. We have these things, these huge media things that we trust with all the information that is given to us. But we need to be wise. And we need to sort of keep it in the back of our minds and think, is that true? And test it. Another one from Romans 12. Be not conformed by this world. Don't get changed by this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable, the perfect will of God. The art of deception. Uh, this is, I think this is this week. Russian hacking aims to destabilise West. The art of deception. Look at that guy, man. He's got to be go, surely. Putin has also been producing misinformation to destabilise the West. And my question was, is the West innocent of this, though? Is there any kingdom of man that is innocent of you know, lying? <clears throat> As Christadelphians, we know the end game, don't we? Are Russia and the US in the Middle East to sort out ISIS and to bring peace to the world? That's the story they're telling us, isn't it? Or are they there because of oil and gas dominance? So here's a pic um, here of... This is a US slash you know, Qatar Saudi Arabia pipeline that they want to get up through here, into Sy through Syria, and into Europe. And obviously, Russia up here has pipelines going into Europe, has a bit of a monopoly up there. But also, Russia wants to get the pipeline from uh, Iran, Iraq, and Syria through here and into Europe as well. And you know, the US loves putting sanctions. And this week, they've just put a sanction on, on Iran as well. And uh, interesting enough as well, Iran has said, we're dumping the US dollar, we've had enough of your games. And uh, I can imagine Putin would probably be in their ear about that as well. The USA, obviously, would like to see Syria destabilised so they can get a pipeline from Saudi Arabia to Europe. And of course, Putin doesn't want this. He doesn't want his market share taken there in Europe. So this is the game that they're playing. Are they there to bring peace and to get rid of ISIS? Or are they there for money, oil, and global dominance. Well, I know which one makes more sense, so you need to sort of think, which one makes more sense? We know man, we're men ourselves. How would we act if, you know, we were leaders of a, a nation and our fleshly things got the better of us? But tonight, I don't want to look at the most current events. With the time that I've got left, I want to have a look at the cycles of an empire. Now, there's six stages to an empire. What does that mean? All of man's empires end. Every single one has ended in our lifetime. Now, there's six stages. There's the pioneer stage. It doesn't look very fun. There's no iPhones there. The age of conquest. It's the age of commerce. And some gold. The age of affluence. Hopefully no one recognised what that is. The age of intellect. Um, if you're conspiracy, you probably might not believe that that ever happens. But then there's the age of decadence. And that's the one that we want to look at mostly tonight. Empires generally last for about eight to ten generations, from the early pioneers that we've just seen to the consumers of everything. They become a burden on the state. And tonight we're going to focus on the last stage, 
decadence. And there's a picture from Asterix and Obelix. You've probably seen something like that before. And just look at that and just think, that's it. That's the epitome of decadence. It's just drinking and eating. And the, uh, the, word, the word meaning for decadence is a moral or cultural decline as characterised by excessive indulgence in pleasure and luxury. But what do we know? Kingdoms of men, kingdoms of men, always end. And here's a picture of a beautiful Colosseum, which was, it's fallen down. And then we have a picture of, uh, I actually don't know what that is, but let's just pretend it's America and look at it. Is it going to last forever? Well, history says otherwise. <clears throat> So what destroys an empire? Is it their enemies? Usually the empire destroys itself from within, history tells us. And the people feel that. You know, The people used to feel great. At the peak of an empire, we were on top of the world. But we're not feeling it anymore. And there's a last oomph at the end of the empire. And what was that slogan that Donald Trump keeps saying last year? Make America great again. Let's make it great again. But these things happen in cycles and it's on the way down, brothers and sisters. What did Solomon say? There's nothing new under the sun. Things happen in cycles and all things go the same. Now, there's a common theme in decadence. There's an undisciplined, overextended military, a display of unmeasurable wealth, massive disparity between the rich and the poor, a desire to live off a bloated state, Centrelink, etc., an obsession with sexual immorality, and one that's the most common is the debasement of currency. So here we have this is an old $100 note from the US. Treasury, United States, $100 in gold coin, $100. So it's a certificate that you had $100 worth of gold coin in the bank. So you could go to your, take your note into the bank, and you could walk out with your gold. And the US and the UK both started on gold standard, but that is long since abandoned. And the Constitution of America actually said that we must never leave the gold standard. Well, they've broken that, and the government now is unconstitutional. I guess the people don't really know that. <clears throat> we have another slide here. This is the US national debt. So here's 1940. I guess that's the end of the Second World War. We put on a little bit of debt there. As we come along, we get to 1970. Now, this guy, the president called Ronald Reagan, he, this is when he disconnected the US um, uh, gold standard from the dollar note. And you can just see the rise here. Boom. And then it just really starts to go vertical here, especially in 2008. Boom. All the money that's being printed into, into oblivion. We also have another chart here as well. Same thing, enter Brent, uh, end of Brenton Woods, which was that... Um, uh, the end of the gold uh, backed by the US dollar. You can slowly see the start at rise. Um, gets to about 2000 here with that, uh, I think we had a tech bubble crash there in the stock market. It started printing a lot of money. In 2008, it just goes vertical. All right, so these are all the paper reserves that they printed and central banks around the world own. Now we've got up here in the 2014, I wasn't really going to talk about this, but people, uh, countries around the world now are, trying, uh, are selling the US dollar. You can see this little thing here. So you can already see the decline that people are starting to get rid of this US dollar. You're going to see it's in this massive bubble and uh, they've just printed this thing and there's nothing backing it and they want to get rid of it. Uh, here's another thing. Inflation, silently robbing you of your purchasing power. So as you can see in 1998, 20 bucks gets you a full shopping cart. Not 2005, sort of half full. And now, well, 2014 is an old picture. You get about three or four items. Not really much, really, is it? <clears throat> My grandma used to say, oh, save your dollars. Well, that was bad advice. Here's, here you go, in 1913. This is the dollar was worth one dollar. Boom, boom, boom. Now it's down here. Your dollars are worth 97% less than they once were. And in 10 years, they may not even be worth the paper they're printed on. As you can see in Venezuela and places like that now, they don't actually count your money, they just weigh it. So they get your money and they put it on a weigh and they go, oh, that weighs about 10 grams, that's probably around about $10 million. Um, and buy you an apple probably. 
<clears throat> um, so yeah, my grandma said, save in currency, you'll lose, um, unless you're getting some pretty good interest. Why? Because it's not backed by anything. You can print, and now well, we say print, but they can add a push of a button, add dollars onto the screen. It's robbery. Those dollars that you sweat for, someone at the click of a mouse can add currency, which makes your dollars worth less and buy you less. Rome was no different. Every empire was no different. The denarius started out solid silver, but by the end, it was a thin layer of silver on a mostly copper coin, and at the end, it ended up just looking like copper. And the same thing with senators and politicians. They started out caring for the people, much like Abraham Lincoln and uh, people that wrote the Constitution. But at the time went on, they cared more about how much wealth they could steal from the top. But what was another common trait in the end of an age? Sport. The people of Rome were distracted by gladiator events. The politicians knew this. They would create a tremendous amount of events and entertainment to distract the people of what was really going on. Is it much different from today? Getting paid dollars. There's a UFC guy, uh, I think his name is Ewan McGregor. Uh, we have a soccer player up there, with another soccer player. Massive house near the beach. Probably doesn't even live in it. Probably got about 30 of them. <clears throat> Are we much different? Well, back in Rome, there was this man, and uh, that's actually a picture from uh, Ben Hur. So sorry about that. But this man called Gaius Apuleius Dossiles. Okay, he was a charioteer, and he specialised in four horse riding. He raced four horse chariots, and he amassed a fortune. 36 million sesterces, in dollar terms today, that was $7 billion. It blew my mind when I uh, watched this on a documentary and I learnt about this. And Professor Peter Strzok says, best paid athlete of all time. They're much like today, isn't it? The people of Rome were distracted, and so are we. Ask someone in your workplace, you know what's happening in the Middle East? They don't really know or they don't even care. But they're really good at, hey, you know what, I know which team's going to win, and they're placing their bets in the paper and on their favourite teams. Just like the senators distracted people from real issues with entertainment, what are they distracting us from today? A big TV in your room, watching some snowboarding? Or is that just a bit conspiracy? You know, a bit of a conspiracy stuff. I'll let you guys decide that. But people actually do love this stuff. They love sport because they don't have a purpose anymore. They are searching for happiness. And what's everyone obsessed with today that's not only, it's only really taken off in the last 10 years? Celebrity chefs. The Romans, the Ottomans, and the Spanish made celebrities out of their chefs. Everyone is searching for it. Maybe it's in the best food. Maybe it's in this crab from the Atlantic that's thousands of metres under the water and there's only one of them, you know, or maybe it's in clothes, maybe it's in wine, maybe it's in music, movies, etc, etc. You can never get enough of what you don't need. The flesh can never be satisfied with these things. And who else lived in an age of decadence? Well, King Solomon did, didn't he? Uh, David did all the fighting. And so Solomon's big search for happiness. So he sort of sent out and he thought, well, you know what, I'm going to go search out for happiness. I'm going to do everything that my heart desires in the flesh, in fine wine and alcohol. Well, that didn't end well. And he wrote about that a lot. Women, a thousand plus. Didn't really need his advice there. No, I'm only joking, sorry. In song and music, Solomon said, he amassed huge amounts of wealth in gold. Silver was considered nothing. Even in education, he says, you can spend your whole life getting a PhD, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but it doesn't even matter. You can assess all this stuff and gain all this knowledge, but it never makes you happy. Fame and power, he had all of that as well. People heard about his wisdom. The Queen of Sheba, oh, how great you are. What was his conclusion? Pfft, it's the breath of wind. It's nothing. It's a waste of time. 
I went out searching for happiness with all this stuff, and it's nothing. It's a puff of wind. What do we start to realise? That people need a strong moral conviction. In my opinion, they need God. Man's empires go through all these stages, and once the kingdom's established, and they get all wealthy, and they go, well, oh, is that it, is it? And man's empires and kingdoms do not work. They do not last. Ask yourself the question, is the Western way of life that we live in America, in England, here in Australia, is it sustainable forever? Let's have a look. This here is in China. It's a ghost city. Now, if you remember in the 2008 crisis, Australia did okay because we're, you know, we're iron ore company and we sell all this stuff to China, but they're just building massive cities for no one. There's a fake economy right there. What are we doing with all our rubbish? Well, I don't know, let's just dig a hole and put it somewhere, I guess. Is it sustainable forever? On one hand, we have obesity, but on the other hand, we have malnutrition. What kind of system has man created? I remember a science teacher when I was in year eight, and I was too young and too nervous. He, remembers, you know, he talks about war and he said, how could God let this happen? And now I wish I could go back and say, well, you know, God has given man the ability to look after the earth and every crisis that has ever happened is because of man's greed and the way he has run it. Life as we know it is on the way out. We are in the last stage of an empire. So whether the kingdom comes or not, I don't know, but we know that the Western world and the way it is headed, we're, ne we're up for the next stage, for the next empire. But we wait for a kingdom that has no end, and one that is sustainable, and whose ruler is just, and the people in it will have a moral, moral conviction and a purpose. It will not run and need all these distract, distractions. <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk a little bit about banking. I know no one likes talking about this, and Matt Wiggs will probably is, uh, nod your ears off about this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living together in society, they create for themselves, in the course of time, a legal system that authorises it and a moral code that glorifies it. Now, I'm not going to go too much into it um, because I don't, want to, I don't want to bore you, um, but there is one thing which is federal law, and it's called a fractional reserve banking. And this is what uh, applies in today in Australia, in the US, and all the central banks around the world. Um, I'm going to explain it very briefly, and if you get confused, maybe talk to Matt Wiggle later. Um, <clears throat> so basically, I've got a thousand bucks. I put it into the bank. Okay, the bank goes. I'm going to have, only has to. The bank only has to keep ten percent of your cash. It doesn't have to keep it all. That's why there ends up being a run on the banks. Everyone's in trouble. It only has to keep ten percent. It goes. You know what? I'm going to give nine hundred dollars to this man. This man pays this contractor because he built. I don't know. He built a chair for him. This contractor takes it. To make things easy, takes it to the same bank, deposit his $900. The bank goes, oh, sweet, fresh $900, and then so on and so on and so on. Eventually, what happens is $1,000 turns into 10 grand. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so, and not only that, they charge interest on it. Henry Ford said, if everyone knew what the uh, banking system was up to, there'd be a revolution tomorrow. And you have to go over this a few times, don't you? And you think, is this really happening? And for reality to sink in? <clears throat> you know, there's enough in the world for everyone's need, but there's not enough for everyone's greed. But, you know, you look at this system, right? And you think, okay, it's legal. The federal uh, government or whatever uh, around the world made this thing legal. But what does God and Jesus think about it, of this system, even though it is legal? In God's eyes, it's illegal. Let's have a look here. Honest weights and measurements. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his, del his delight. Uh, a, simple, uh, a similar thing happened in God's temple, didn't it? 
where they were changing money into temple money, and obviously they were you know, changing it and it was unjust with unjust weights, and we know what Jesus thought of that, didn't we? And here's a picture that I got off the internet. Den of thieves, and there's Jesus, um, an artist's description of uh, Jesus whipping uh, the likes of Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Goldman Sachs. Whether he does that at the end, uh, when he comes back, I don't know. <clears throat> the borrower is slave to the lender, and Jesus also says, you can't serve two masters. If you're in debt, you're a slave, and the bank is your master. So what's the lesson? Just try not to get into too much debt, as it will make it harder for you to live the truth and serve God as you have two masters. Now, look, I don't actually know the answer to this. The system that man has created means that we have to sign a contract for a 30-year loan, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and if you say, oh, look, I don't, um, I don't own a house, I rent, you're paying someone else's, uh, you're paying someone else's debt, aren't you? Um, it's this evil system which I'm sure God and Jesus hate. What does mortgage mean? The old French word meaning is death pledge. Sign your life away. If you have to get into debt, my advice is to just live within your means. Uh, by the way, I'm not pointing the finger out on anyone and trying to make anyone feel uncomfortable. I also am in debt and I find it very hard not to live in this uh, environment without taking out some debt for a house for my family and my children. <clears throat> but the Western Empire is unsustainable and all currency in history, as we look through it, always returns to its intrinsic value, which is nothing. Zero. As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Now, does Russia and China believe the system, the US system of the US dollar will collapse? Now, this is really interesting. Russian central bank gold reserves. So, sort of like, you know, fluffed around here and all comes along. 2008, they've just gone ballistic. Now, why would Russia be buying an old relic, as we get told by the mainstream media, something that you don't really need in this world because everything's electronic? Why are they buying something like this? And China's graph, China is exactly the same. They've been actually even buying more, and a graph more, it looks more like this. Do they believe that the system will collapse? Russia and China are buying real assets. They know something is going down very soon. So what will happen first? The collapse of the euro, which will make the people give their freedom for security. And there'll be a little, con uh, you know, because at the moment, I guess the European Union, there's, uh, there's a whole heap of countries. Um, but we read about, you know, there's 10. And do we take that literally? I'm not sure. but. I sort of have a feeling that we should, and there's these 10 countries that will give their, uh, give their leadership to the beast and they will rule with them for a time. Or will we see the US dollar bubble burst and see a collapse there? Or will we see war first? Or will we see all three of those? <clears throat> Doesn't matter which one comes first, they're all leading to war eventually. Now, here's just some coming events through the last couple of weeks that I had a look at. China deploys long-range nuclear-capable missiles to coast in response to Donald Trump's aggression. Um, yeah, so it readies itself to pressures imposed by the US government. And uh, this um, next one as well is from a group chat that I'm on with a couple of people here. Ex-Soviet leader, I'm not sure what his name is there, I'm not going to try warns that countries are preparing for World War III. It all looks as if the world is preparing for war, says the former Russian president. And there's just a picture there and a video, but I don't have that on there, but US tanks and troops in Poland um, for the national threat. So I was telling this all to my wife and she hates when I talk about all this kind of stuff. She's like, what's the point of it all? You know, what's the encouragement? Well, what is the lesson to learn? Well. The world that we live in, the Western world that we live in, is very close to an end. It's reached its peak and we're on the way down. It ended in 2008 and it's on life support. They've just been printing the, uh, the currency out of, out, into oblivion. 
and have also been manipulating the gold price to say, oh, you know, everything is going fine and we have this great recovery. The debt bubble is about to pop and there will be a time of chaos like we've never seen before, which will make the Great Depression in 2008 look like a walk in the park or a Sunday school picnic. So my advice is, and this is what I said to myself, is forget about your future in this lifestyle. This kingdom is about to end. Forget about your retirement, because we know that the government and the banks can easily go, you know what, we're going to use your money to bail out the big guys. Forget about your investments. Focus on our community. This is our strong point, isn't it, brothers and sisters? This is our strong point. There's a lot of people out there that don't have the community that we have. Let's grow our relationships. And if we do have to stay here in these times of trouble, we do have each other. And that is a beautiful thing that we have. We might lose everything, but we have each other. Let's grow in the truth. And this is the thing we need to ask ourselves and myself, and this is what I ask myself, who am I? Or who are you? When all of life's work, all your life's work is ripped away, and all your money that you've saved over time, all your certificates and your things and your PhDs, your education, everything that means something to you is ripped from you, what kind of person are you? Are you a person of God? And I remember this week, actually, I was talking to this guy, and he's, uh, uh, he's not a Christian elf or anything, and we just bumped in, and he said, oh, you know, I've been reading this book about Viktor Frankl. I said, oh, I've read that book. It's about that uh, psychologist that went through, the, um, went through the Holocaust, and everything was ripped from him. He had his life work. He had it tucked in, 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 his, um, in his coat, and one of the uh, SS guards just laughed at him and took it off him and just burnt it in front of him. And it was years and years of work that he had done. Everything was taken from him, his family. And he said, there's one thing they can't take. It's up here, the last human freedom. What kind of person are you, brothers and sisters? When everything is stripped away, pretty full-on picture, and there's a lot more that are full-on than that. I mean, you look at that and you, th you just think, that's what God has to do, really, to bring his people back. Strip them of absolutely everything, and then they just strive to come back to the land. Or will you look back? Don't get attached to everything that might tempt you to looking back. You know, one day you're going to have to, you know, I don't know how it happens. People always say, oh, you know, angel knocks on the door. You know, you know, usually pick up your keys and your wallet. You're going to have to leave all of that behind, everything behind. You have to let it go. How attached are you? And here's some pictures that I think that we, we could look forward to as a look forward to having a real king, someone who is just and a real kingdom. Um, I guess it's a picture of Jesus holding a kid. I mean, I looked at these photos and uh, it, brings, it does bring a tear to my eye. I know it's a little bit corny, but I just think, you know, you just, it's, a, it's, it's a real king, someone who is just, not like a politician that says all these lovely words, but you know that, um, that Jesus Christ, uh, a man that cannot lie, has never sinned, um, is our leader. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. 
Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service where we produce two or three exhortations per week which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on World News events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time, and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation, so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.